Hello and welcome to Archives and Records Simplified. These videos are aimed at people looking for basic knowledge about archives and records management, although at times I will also touch slightly on information and library science. These videos are designed to provide bite-sized chunks, which means that almost every video will be less than 15 minutes. These videos are honestly for everyone and comments and suggestions are always more than welcome. About me, Sean McMillan, I'm an archivist based in London, and you can learn mo more about me via my LinkedIn profile, to which there is a link posted below. And I'll also post a transcript and notes also if you struggle at any point to understand my accent. And lastly, if you enjoy these videos, I would be extremely grateful if you could kindly like, subscribe and share. Thanks again. OK, so this video is about managing volunteers. All right, and a quick overview. So volunteers can often play a very, very useful role in an archive or a library. Uh, there are a range of tasks that volunteers can undertake depending on their interests and their skills. And it's worth noting that volunteering is growing in the archive sector. This has been observed by the Archives and Records Association, who also offer a further breakdown on what volunteers are doing and the sort of demographics of people getting involved. I think one of the things I noted from their website was that volunteers seem to be more common or seem to be growing more in public authorities, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, but certainly most of the larger organisations I've worked at, um, oh, in fact, I would say probably almost every organisation I've worked for has probably had at least some volunteer working for them at some point. Um, it can be a fantastic opportunity to gain experience or possibly explore a passion. I think that most of the master's courses often require some volunteering experience before enrolment. Um, but I should say that both parties should benefit and it should not be an alternative to a trained archivist. Um, I have seen over the last maybe five or six years, there have been the occasional posts advertised to volunteers that I've personally thought were a wee bit questionable. This video in no way encourages that. It should be of benefit to both parties involved. OK, so I think that what I'm going to do with this video is I'm going to talk you through the processes of managing a volunteer and the things you might want to consider. And I think it's worth pointing out that there, you would want to assess their skills and interests as early as possible. So this means looking at what your volunteer is capable of doing and also looking at what they're interested in doing. And that might depend on why they're volunteering. If it's something out of a passion or an interest, then they may have a proclivity towards certain tasks. If they're preparing for one of the master's courses or they're trying to learn more about a specific topic, then that's something you need to think about. One thing I would say is that I would make a distinction between sort of basic tasks and perhaps more complex tasks. And although this is a bit of a generalization, I would say that there are certain tasks which I would be more inclined to give it to a volunteer before others. So the more basic tasks are things like box listing, referencing, fetching materials, providing information services, basic preservation tasks, so that's like removing paper clips, um, transcriptions, so transcribing written text, um, some social media work, I've put an asterisk next to that because you, you would need to be careful with that. And I think you would want to be, you maybe want to have checks and balances there to ensure that materials aren't, uh, sorry, information isn't posted wrongly. Um, and then maybe basic metadata tasks and digitization. Uh, more complex tasks where I'd be a little bit hesitant um, to willy nilly give to a volunteer are things like cataloging, appraisal, sensitivity reviewing, maybe more complex digital preservation tasks, accession work, uh, maybe more detailed promotional archives, and also detailed information requests. Um, this is maybe where users are asking for very specific information that might require the knowledge of the archivist or a professional who works there for more detail. So uh, as I say, I think it's worth differentiating between these two tasks and maybe looking at the basic tasks first. OK, I would say the next step, I would say you would also want to be very considerate of standards and goals. Now, the first thing I'll point out is, especially if you work for a larger organisation, is it might be worth thinking about if your organisation has a volunteer policy. Now, as I mentioned, volunteering has been growing. It has become more common. 
in many institutions will have a policy relating to volunteers. I would always check this in the first instance and you know I would consider if your institution has something like this and um, there might be very specifics there about certain tasks they can undertake, uh, maybe health and safety training they might have to do before volunteering for you and it might have other details such as what your policy is regarding expenses and so forth. Um, after that, I think you want to think very clearly about your priorities and goals. Um, I would say that the volunteering has to suit both parties. It has to suit you as well. So maybe think about what your priorities and goals are as an archive and then see where the volunteer fits within that. Um, if it doesn't fit within that, then sometimes it's better just to be honest and maybe explain this and also po possibly give recommendations of where else the volunteer might work. Um, but as I say, be very clear that the volunteer's work fits within what you're trying to achieve as an archive. Um, I would say it's also important to set very clear goals and examples. So if you sign, uh, you assign a volunteer a set of work, um, I think you want to make this as clear as possible. And I think where possible, maybe give examples of previous work that's been undertaken. Uh, so for example, I remember managing a volunteer once that did some box listing for me. And I remember I, I gave her an example of 10 boxes I'd box listed that she could then carry on for the rest of the boxes. Um, I think it can be very useful to set timetables and plan for setbacks. This can really help you sort of have a focus in mind and also overcome inevitable setbacks, which happens in any project. Um, I think there's also something to be said of providing written guidance where possible. Um, sometimes it might be as simple as a one sheet explanation of a process. Um, I remember managing someone during a digitization process and I found that it really helped immensely when I was able to sort of give a five step process of what to do. Um, sometimes the most basic written guidance can go a really long way. Um, I also think it helps a lot when you provide context about why these goals and tasks matter. So if you can demonstrate why certain activities or why certain tasks are really worth doing. Um, so for example, it might be that you ask the volunteer to add reference marks to items. Um, that is a crucial task in archives. Um, that's crucial to being able to retrieve items. It's crucial to being able to make them accessible um, having some sort of intellectual control. If you can provide context about why the goals you're assigning them will help you as an institution, I really think it helps a lot. Um, and also provide relevant training where needed. This kind of chimes back to what I said in the previous slide about assessing their abilities and, and maybe thinking about what tasks you're giving them. Um, you know, provide what, think about what training you might need to give them and decide whether you're able to do that. And, and lastly, I would say you would always need to throughout this process consider if the trade-offs are worth it. Um, the benefit to the institution is that essentially someone's working for you for free, but Maybe one of the trade-offs is that you could possibly be taking someone on with less experience or less knowledge and the time it takes for you to train that person and monitor their work might be more than if you'd hired someone. So as I say, it has to be best for both parties. It absolutely has to be best for the volunteer and also has to be best for you too. And I, I think throughout this process, it's better to be as honest as possible. Okay, so in terms of managing volunteers, and providing feedback and review. Um, what I would say is really useful when managing volunteers or, or when managing anyone in general is to monitor the early stages of a task as much as possible. Um, it's my experience that often volunteers are given very repetitive tasks which take a long time to repeat. So for example, it might be that the volunteer is asked to do a box list or that they're asked to undertake fetching or that they're asked to maybe do some sort of transcription work or foliation. That's another one where they're asked to go through sheets of archives and note the, the numbers of the pages. I think that monitoring their work in the very, very early stages can help you quality control a lot better. So if you notice any mistakes in what they're doing, you want to identify those mistakes as soon as possible so that by the time you notice they've not been replicated multiple times. If you do have to give feedback, by all means make it constructive and also try give useful tips for improvement. So I always think that, you know, it's never enough just to highlight a problem. You also want to come up with tips for improvement and you also maybe want to explain why you maybe want to explain your decisions and explain why certain practices may be a certain way. Um, something to consider, especially in the early stages, is depending on the volunteer's previous experience, they might not know some of the basics about working in an archive. So for example, it might not occur to them that you can't eat or drink when working with rare materials. 
um, some, that's something you might want to explain. And when explaining it, I think it goes a much it goes much longer when you explain why that is and the dangers it can pose to items and the da dangers it can cause in terms of pest control, etc. So explaining decisions and dis you know explaining the logic behind those decisions, uh, I really thoroughly recommend that. I think it's very useful. Um, I also think it's really important to recognise good work. Um, people like praise, you know, people like to receive positive feedback. And I think if someone's taking the time to volunteer for you, um, you should you should recognise good work where possible. And I also think it can be really useful to follow up with thanks and appreciation. So whenever someone's volunteered for me and they've done a good job, sometimes, you know, even if it's a couple of days later or on the day, sometimes I'll just send them an email wishing them the best and just saying thanks for doing that. And I think small things like that can make a big difference. Um, I've sort of harked on to this near the start of the presentation, but I would say try not rely on volunteers to meet vital aims and objectives. I've said try there, but actually hiring volunteers is not, sorry, well, you're not hiring them. Employing the use of volunteers um, should not be a substitute for, for professional work. You know, and uh, if you're relying on volunteers to meet important aims and objectives, I would see that as a red flag, that that's not something I would recommend. And also more generally, especially if you're dealing with someone that's early career and looking to gain experience, always, you know, mention that you're you're happy to provide a reference. Um, sometimes it's best to mention it. They might not be as open or they might be a bit reserved about asking for it. And also encourage opportunities. Um, if you're working with someone that's really new to the sector and has no idea what sort of what to expect from being an archivist, remember, you might have a lot of knowledge that they don't. And there could be a lot of knowledge uh, that's very common to you and very accepted to you, but not so much to them. So it might be that you know you can you're able to recommend a master's course that they're able to undertake. You're able to recommend you might spot a job that comes up on one of the list serves. You know I, I think you know encourage them to undertake opportunities where possible, and maybe if possible, if it's someone that's early careers or early professional, maybe see if you can sort of identify a plan of improvement and give them a sort of structure for how they might get the best out of this volunteering experience. Okay, and just some general tips um, that I just generally recommend when managing volunteers. First of all, be as honest as possible. I think this is best for you and it's best for them. Uh, you know, I think sometimes when someone's working for you for free, um, you know, providing criticism it can maybe be a bit tricky because it's it doesn't come naturally when the person's giving you their time for free. But I really think it's much kinder to give constructive criticism as early as possible and to be make sure that they're learning from it as well. And also not all volunteering arrangements work out and sometimes it's best for both parties if it doesn't continue and that's something you need to think about. So by all means be as honest as possible and um, also, also be as kind as possible and be as empathetic as possible. I would also say that it can really help to encourage questions and self-reflect. Um, sometimes volunteers, um, very often, you know, they'll have degrees and backgrounds and other topics, and sometimes it's possible they know things that you don't. So it's, it's definitely possible that they could make a suggestion or a recommendation that's really worth considering, especially if they come from a different background, and especially if they're maybe at the older end of the spectrum, if it's someone that's maybe coming in just per, out of pure passion because they're interested in learning or they're interested in archives and they just have a real interest in local history. You know, it's possible they may have had a background in another field and I would be open to to what their experience could be and maybe insights and knowledge that they could contribute. Um, I would also recommend that you try to be as flexible as possible, um, you know, be flexible with times and resources and also keep a positive attitude and lead by example. Um, and if you're ever in a position where things are not going well, then I would say act as early as possible, give specific factual feedback, provide training where possible, encourage conversations, reconsider goals if needed and try have a sort of scaled responses in terms of the sort of actions you could take to help them improve. Um, and, you know, by scaled responses, the very earliest one might be a sort of an informal conversation and then sort of moving on from there, such as giving written guidance. OK, and finally, just some additional reading and sources. Um, of all the sources here, I thoroughly recommend the Carrie and Flynn article, Managing Volunteers in Archives. Um, otherwise, thanks again for listening and please leave any comments or suggestions below. Thanks again.
And if you enjoy these videos, I would be extremely grateful if you could like, subscribe and share. And also just to remind you that I would be absolutely delighted to take any requests for future videos also.